Welcome everybody uh, to today's ACRL Spark Forum. Uh, I'm Nick Shockey, Spark's Director of Programs and Engagement, uh, and I'm thrilled to moderate our discussion uh, today uh, featuring members of different editorial boards uh, who have exerted uh, you know, their role there to, uh, to sort of retake control of uh, their journals and the communities that, that they serve. Uh, we're thrilled to co-organize uh, today's forum with ACRL and ACRL's Reset Committee, which we've been doing now for well, well over a decade. And before we get in uh, to the discussion, I want to mention that our partners at ACRL uh, have just published a book this week, uh, Scholarly Communication, Librarianship, and Open Knowledge, that I wanted to mention briefly before we, we get into the session. The book was supported by IMLS and edited by Maria Bond, Josh Bullock, and Will Cross. And it provides some really much needed support for scholarly communication librarians in understanding both the theory and practice of the wide areas uh, of work related to scholarly communications, honestly, sometimes too wide. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's written by folks that are doing uh, this work and that are too numerous uh, to name here. Uh, on the webcast, but you should check out the table of contents for the, the book. I'll post a link in the chat in just a little bit uh, and thank them too. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are on the call today. So if so, uh, please wave in the chat. It should be open for everybody so that we can give folks uh, a round of Zoom applause for uh, this, this book. It you know covers crucial topics that easily could have gotten short shrift um, from others, including things like vocational awe, that you know, not everything should be digitized, and that failure is an option, uh, among many, many others. Uh, you know, it ends with a call to contribute, and I think, to me, one of the most impactful things about the book and the projects, that it is supported by a living community that is producing a complementary resource in the scholarly communications notebook uh, to sort of extend the impact of this work. And so as we head into Open Access Week, this book and how it was created, honestly, I think are a powerful example of what it looks like to center community. Um, and just want to thank IMLS and ACRL again for supporting the book and uh, express congratulations to Maria, Josh, Will, and all of the individual contributors who put so much effort and care into the book and into the living resource that complements it. Uh, again, feel free to uh, to celebrate this uh, awesome resource in the in the chat, which again should be should be open. So, in many ways, I I feel like this book, Scholarly Communications, Librarianship, and Open Knowledge, and the intention behind it are really the perfect lead in to today's panel uh, that features four editorial board members who have taken a similarly intentional approach to their roles as editors um, and you know resigned. Uh, over concerns regarding commercial publisher policies that conflicted with the best interests of the communities that their journals sought to serve. The history of editorial board resignations uh, in protest over commercial publisher policies is actually a long one, uh, likely longer than some folks uh, might realize stretching back well over a decade. These have often been centered on objections related to a shift to open access um, and these resignations and the new journals that they've catalyzed are a very powerful strategy for scholars uh, to create immediate change and take back control over their publications. Over the past year, I think as many others have noticed, this trend has increased and become even more noticeable, uh, often receiving coverage on listservs and hallway conversations, uh, real or virtual, and even by the press. The concerns driving this trend are numerous and extend well beyond the panel that we'll have here today. Many, as folks know, center on objections to high publishing fees, but an increasing number are also tied to increasing expectation from some publishers to vastly expand publication volume, uh, and also tied to concerns regarding alignment with the publisher uh, on the, what is in the best interests uh, of the journal and the community that the journal seeks to serve. Uh, Spark, uh, our organization has long sought to support editors in considering these transitions. Uh, and I'll briefly plug uh, a Spark resource on the topic uh, in, in the chat. Uh, not as smoothly as I hoped. There we go. Um, 
And today's conversation is deeply relevant to this year's Open Access Week theme of community over commercialization, both in highlighting instances where commercialization seems to be prioritized over community and in exploring the concrete action that individuals can take to recalibrate that relationship and this equation when and where needed. So uh, that intro out of the way, before we dive in, I wanna touch in on a few notes for today's webcast. Uh, one is, just to note that we are recording today's discussion, so please be aware of that when typing in the chat or Q&A box. Also, given the number of participants today, we do ask that you submit questions through Zoom's Q&A function, which you should be able to find at the bottom uh, toolbar of the screen if you mouse over uh, the Zoom window. We'd also encourage you to submit questions at any time during the session and to feel free to use the chat actively to comment, to share your own related experiences, uh, or even to introduce yourself uh, on the call now uh, as we're, we're getting started. Uh, we'll hear presentations from each of our four panelists, uh, and then we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes for discussion. So uh, truly keep the, the questions and comments uh, coming, and we'll get to those uh, in the last half of the 90-minute the discussion that we have. So uh, with that, I'd like to to sort of jump into the meat of today's discussion. And I'll introduce uh, our, our first panelist briefly, and then I'll introduce each uh, each other panelist subsequently just before they uh, they speak. So to kick off uh, to kick off the discussion, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Kristen Kennedy, who is an associate professor at the School of Behavior and Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Kennedy leads the Kennedy Neuroimaging and Aging and Cog Neuroimaging of Aging and Cognition Lab within the University's Center for Vital Longevity. Uh, her work focuses on the neural, genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that influence the aging of the brain and in part determine how well we are able to age cognitively. Dr. Kennedy also serves as a senior editor of the open access journal Imaging Neuroscience, which was formed following the resignation of the editorial board of NeuroImage. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, uh, over to you to kick us off. Hi, thank you so much um, for putting this together and inviting us to be part of it. I thought maybe I would use my time to just give kind of a summary of the experience that we had at my journal, and then I can answer questions uh, later. So uh, like Nick said, I um, was a senior editor at the journal NeuroImage, um, which was published by Elsevier. And I think NeuroImage was um, an interesting journal because it, tends to keep its editorial board members for a very, very long time. And so we functioned as uh, really a family. And we, we met um, a couple of times a year and all of the editors in chief that I had always worked under um, very much ran the journal by consensus. And so any major or even sometimes minor decisions that would be made for the journal um, we would kind of poll ourselves and ask, you know, what is best for the scientific community. And so just to give you kind of a little bit of a feel of what our editorial board was like, um, NeuroImage was also a very, very high um, throughput journal. And so I think by December of every year, the um, manuscript numbers that were being assigned um, ha have hit 3,000. And so it's a very... Um, we handled a lot of papers. And so the editorial board also um, was pretty large. And it's um, one of the largest, probably the most popular um, neuroimaging journal. It's certainly the journal um, with the highest impact factor. And so we had grown and built this journal and felt pretty proud of it. And we felt like we were, um, we weren't a society journal, but we almost kind of functioned like a society journal. Um, and so just over time in talks with Elsevier, as we went through the transition to open access, which we kind of um, eagerly initiated with Elsevier, we wanted to be one of the journals that kind of um, set that pace because I don't know if in retrospect, everything is naive, I guess, but I guess naively, we thought that this will be great because people will have access to all of the papers because they'll be in the public domain and it won't be um, 
paywalled in a way that just the general public, the taxpayers, whoever can't get a hold of the research. And so we actually kind of spearheaded and championed that. And we were one of the first um, journals to kind of turn over to open access. Um, and it, it went pretty well. And then the, um, the um, APC um, increased. So where the um, payments that the authors have to make to publish their journal um, increased. And, and then they increased a little bit more. And so we started having conversations with people at Elsevier and say, can we bring this down to something a little bit more manageable? And um, they got back to the editor in chief and said, well, let's, um, let, let's talk about it, right? And so we kind of made a suggestion that was pretty modest, um, a few hundred dollars um, to lower it. And we didn't hear back from them. And so we kind of pushed them again and we didn't hear back from them. And so our editor in chief, um, Steve Smith, he's um, a very good leader. And he's like, we feel very, very strongly about this. And um, we, we really would like to get the publication fees down to 2000 at least, if not a little lower. Um, and we feel so strongly about this that if you can't budget a little bit and bring it down a little bit, we're prepared to resign um, en masse. And we had had meetings about this um, internally, obviously, and that, you know, this is the last thing we want to do. We've built this journal. It's an amazing journal. And um, we assumed it wouldn't come to that. Um, and so when we finally kind of, it came back around, we said, well, you know, what are you guys going to do? Are you going to lower the fees? And they're like, no, we think that this is exactly what the market force value says that they should be we honestly were taken aback. We did not expect them to not lower the fees. And we also weren't going to put something out there and then not put our money where our mouths um, were. And so we quickly started scrambling to find another publisher when we knew we had another publisher um, secured, which is the amazing group at MIT Press. Um, we announced that one day, like on this very given day, we're no longer editors at um, NeuroImage. And the response, the Twitter storm was, I think it was 1.5 million views in about 30 something hours. It was um, astonishing. Um, and so we have have this nice new journal called Imaging Neuroscience at MIT Press. Things are going really well, um, but it was, it was quite an interesting ride along the way, um, just kind of learning the ins and outs of these things. So kind of my brief story. Is that brief enough, too brief? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, next, uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Anna Stills, who is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Politics and Human Values at Princeton University, where her research focuses on questions of political membership, authority, and political obligation, nationalism, and self-determination, rights to land and territory, and collective agency. Uh, Dr. Stills serves as the editor-in-chief of the journal philosophy and public affairs, and also previously served as a member of the editorial board for the Journal uh, of Political Philosophy. Uh, she is also co-editor for social science or for social and political philosophy at the Stanford Encyclope Encyclopedia for Philosophy, which I mentioned because it was also one of the very first open educational resources that I myself uh, ever used and suspect that, that is uh, likely true for others on the call today uh, as well. Um, so Dr. Stills, I'll turn it over to you. So I did make some slides and I'm just gonna try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, can you see those? is white for us at the moment. Okay. Um, These things always work in the practice session uh, and then live. <laughs> there we go, that, that's okay. perfect. Good. Um, great, so thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this. I, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, as Nick mentioned, I'm editor in chief of philosophy of a journal called Philosophy and Public Affairs. And until recently, I was also a member of the editorial board of a journal called Political, uh, the Journal of Political Philosophy. Now, these are two of probably the top three field journals in political philosophy, which is my area. And both journals are published by Wiley. So I wanted to share some of our experiences with Wiley from the perspective of both of these two uh, journals. Um, 
so the in, in 2019, the journal that I now edit, Philosophy and Public Affairs, experienced a crisis with Wiley uh, that began under the my predecessor, the previous editor. Um, the journal had fallen a little bit behind its normal publication schedule, and Wiley used that pretext to initiate a disciplinary review process of the previous editor. And during that process, they demanded, as a condition of improving the journal's performance, that we accept 35 articles within the next 60 days. Now, the journal's historic publication budget over, you know, since it's, it was founded in the early 1970s, it's historically published 12 to 16 articles per year. So that was about 13 times our normal uh, roster of articles. And were we to maintain that publication rate over time, philosophy and public affairs would be publishing over 200 articles a year, not 12 to 16. So my predecessor uh, was facing some health problems and decided to step down. Um, and the body of associate editors nominated me to uh, succeed her. Um, but Wiley refused uh, for eight months to confirm my nomination as editor while they continued to demand that I agree to massively increase uh, the number of articles uh, that we publish. And I refused to, to agree to those demands. Um, Philosophy and Public Affairs has a contract with Wiley, the details of which I'm under an obligation of confidentiality not to divulge. But I can say that they didn't have the legal rights to interfere with the management of the journal um, and the ways that they were trying to do. So we went and we retained legal counsel and we threatened to sue them in, in court uh, to enforce the contract. And after an eight month standoff, they finally backed down. They confirmed my nomination as editor. Um, and since then, relations have been not quite as dire, but still very tense. Uh, they now force us to transfer all the articles that we reject to other widely owned journals in the ho hope of increasing growth rates of publication at other outlets. Um, they also force us to de-anonymize our reviewer reports and transfer those along with um, with the articles in ways that we worry compromise the anonymity of our process. Um, and they forced a lot of other top-down changes to the way we run the journal. So we can't use a lot of the decision statuses that we used to. We used to often use a decision called reject and resubmit for promising articles that need further development. They don't let us do that anymore. They automate their copy editing. So I pay my graduate students to do the copy editing because I can't trust Wiley to handle the copy editing. Um, uh, so, and I've just gotten word that they're envisioning a whole new raft of top-down changes um, to the publication process, including reducing the time between when we accept the article and when it comes out to 10 days uh, and requiring us to adopt a new style guide. So, as I mentioned, I'm not only editor-in-chief of philosophy and public affairs, but I'm also on the editorial board of another, or I was until pretty recently on the editorial board of another uh, journal called the Journal of Political Philosophy. And this is more or less our sister journal, uh, which is also published by Wiley. And its editor, who is a man named Robert Gooden, had started the journal from scratch in 1993 and built it up over time into one of the very top ranked journals in my field. Um, he's a renowned editor and many people, including me, really got their start as unknown academics when they submitted kind of a promising but rough piece to him where he saw some um, some potential in it and really carefully worked with the author to craft the piece into a, a, a top-notch contribution. So this year, Wiley informed uh, Gooden that his contract as editor would be terminated as of December 31st, 2023, without giving any reason. Um, and then later, negotiations with Wiley, uh, between Wiley and Gooden's younger co-editors to succeed him, broke down over the fact that Wiley was imposing quantitative targets on the journal. Um, so they wanted to increase the number of articles by 40% over about three years. And they also wanted um, quote unquote action plans to be put in place for the editors if the editors did not meet those uh, proposed quantitative targets. So the those co-editors felt like that these proposals really compromised um, the Journal of Political Philosophy's independence, and they too loved their journal, wanted to preserve it as an institution, but felt like they couldn't sign a contract on those terms um, and didn't want to publish in accordance with Wiley's commercial imperatives. Uh, so they refused to sign uh, to, to sign a contract with Wiley, and the entire editorial board of the Journal of Political Philosophy 
resigned uh, in May 2023 over these interferences. And then about 1,000 political philosophers have signed a pledge as of 2024 to boycott um, the Journal of Political Philosophy. So to decline any invitation to serve as editor or on the editorial board, to decline to review for it, decline to submit to it, unless and until the journal's editorial independence is restored. So as of my most recent information, this is where things stand. Gooden is fired, his co-editors are out, um, and the boycott uh, of the journal is set to begin as of January 1, 2024. So I just wanna end by saying something about the reasons behind these kinds of total breakdowns in the relationship with Wiley uh, to the point of destroying one of the top journals in my field, and I worry very much threatening the other one, which I edit. Um, so the main reason, as I see it, is that, that Wiley wants to impose these growth targets on the journals it owns is that the profits of commercial publishers are increasingly a function of ridiculously large open access fees that are paid sometimes by authors, but more usually by grant funding agencies or governments or universities. Wiley has signed a lot of these big open access consortium agreements over the past several years that um, you know, specify that these agencies will pay uh, for an article to be released for free. And under that model, they see the way to maximize their profits as maximizing the number of articles that the journal publishes and rushing them to publication as quickly as they possibly can. And I think that explains the pressure that they're placing to target these specific numerical quotas that increase year after year, the decline in copy editing, um, the decline in time spent in review, and so on. So why is all that bad? Well, I think that the the model that these commercial uh, publishers are envisioning for open access is, is diametrically opposed to the core values, at least the core values as I see them of my academic discipline. So historically, I always thought of the mission of my journal as involving kind of uh, four core tasks. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to curate a body of really high quality transformative work uh, in political philosophy for a general readership so that people who wanted to keep abreast of really important developments in the field would know what they should be reading. Uh, and then the second mission that I always thought was really important was to provide really excellent painstaking, painstaking critical comments to authors who submit to the journal so that they could improve their work. If not for publication in my journal, then it for, pub in publication, for publication elsewhere. Uh, so we put a lot of intensive work into helping authors develop their arguments, uh, especially for paper, papers that we think have a lot of potential to be truly uh, transform transformative. And often papers published in our journal go through two or three rounds of review before they're finally accepted. And third, publication and philosophy and public affairs often help to signal um, the truly high quality of young scholars research, uh, who often young scholars who were not yet tenured. Um, and having an article in my journal has, has often really helped to establish a young scholar's reputation and career. And it was often a big matter of pride for us that we could find, you know, genuine diamonds in the rough who had creative new ideas and work closely with them to hone those ideas into compelling arguments and launch their careers. So I think now the, the commercial imperatives of these publishers are just really impeding our ability to do any of that. So if the top journals in political philosophy have to publish you know, 50 articles per year, 100 the next year, 200 in the next, and so on infinitely, then it you know the role of the editorial team kind of becomes superfluous. Why should we spend all this time um, providing careful feedback and comments if the aim is, is to rush as many pieces to publication as possible? Uh, the aim of curating a body of work for a broad readership is completely thrown out the window uh, if we're serving the revenue generating imperatives of the publisher by publishing everything we can then we're not serving the aim of disseminating truly transformative advances in knowledge and, and picking them out as that so that people can be made aware of those advances and build on them. And finally, I think those developments have really serious implications for inequality in our field so. Increasingly, the only people who are going to be able to publish and contribute to the development of knowledge are the people who have enough money to pay, uh, either from their own pockets or from their wealthy universities or their wealthy governments. 
And that means that large swaths of our community, including everyone at poor universities and pretty much everyone who lives in a poor country, is just going to be unable to contribute to knowledge production at all. And so for those reasons, I think we should fight these developments as hard as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and great to see questions already coming in, including rhetorical ones about the location of Wiley's uh, offices. But there is one uh, that I did want to just briefly ask before we uh, move on to, to Dr. McLaren, which is uh, there's a question about um, sort of what type of journals um, the ones uh, were that you were mentioning. Uh, Anna, about, you know, sort of are those uh, those two journals subscription, hybrid, open access? Uh, yeah, they're hybrid. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I figured it'd be helpful to clarify that uh, sort of in the, the moment, uh, but we'll largely hold the questions uh, for the, the Q&A portion. Uh, and again, welcome folks to open up the Q&A panel and submit questions there. Um, I also wanted to thank Allie for her contribution in the chat, um, just speaking to her previous experience uh, as a journal manager for Springer Nature and facing similar uh, you know, pressures uh, to the ones that have, have been mentioned. Uh, already uh, by our panelists uh, in relation to, to other publishers. Um, so thanks so much for that, Allie. Uh, and with that, we will next uh, go to, can I get my notes here? Uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay McLaren is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences uh, and the O'Brien Institute for Public Health at the University of uh, Calgary, where her research and teaching focus on healthy public policy and social determinants of health. Dr. McLaren is a director at large of the Alberta Public Health Association, uh, where she's previously served as its president. She is also the editor-in-chief of the Open Access Journal of Critical Public Health, uh, which was created following the resignation of the editorial board, Critical Public Health, uh, earlier this year. Uh, Dr. McLaren, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, very important forum and have really appreciated the, the comments so far from my, my colleagues here. Um, so as, uh, as Nick said, I'm a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences um, at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And I served for over six years as co-editor-in-chief uh, with Professor Judith Green of an international peer-reviewed journal called Critical Public Health, which is owned and published by Taylor and Francis. Uh, so earlier this year, members of our editorial board, including myself, resigned, and we have started up a new journal called Journal of Critical Public Health, which is published on behalf of a scholarly network that we formed called the Critical Public Health Network, which is an international virtual community. And the journal is hosted at the University of Calgary on their OJS or Open Journal Systems um, platform. Um, so the Journal of Critical Public Health is, is indeed quite new. So I'll just take uh, my few minutes here to, to say a bit about, um, I guess, our journey and our, our experiences mostly leading up to it. Uh, so and what I, I guess, mostly want to emphasize that the word critical in our name is, is really quite important. So the niche of the journal is critical scholarship in public health, which can take many forms, but in general, it means work that engages deeply with power and especially inequities in power and how those shape well-being and health equity. So the journal, since its beginnings in 1979, has always served as a forum for scholar activists to publish work that illuminates and challenges power relations that shape all aspects of health and, and public health. Um, so there, there is somewhat of a built-in uh, or inherent tension for a journal that publishes that kind of scholarship that is also a commodity marketed by a commercial um, publisher. And for, for quite a while, the, the tension was manageable. Um, there were minor things, but the relationship was, was okay. Um, but over the past, I'd say, year and a half or so, um, things started to become quite a bit more, more difficult for us. 
And we, we started to be concerned about our ability to maintain the credibility and integrity of the publication. Um, and it, it just started to feel that the relationship wasn't, wasn't really working. Um, and it, be, it, it had come to a point where it, be, it had become quite clear to us that we needed to consider um, making a change. And so long story short, we, we started to pursue alternative um, arrangements and figuring out an alternative and engaging with, with our communities. And we worked towards um, a resignation on uh, July 5th of, of this year. And we arranged to have the new Journal of Critical Public Health up and running um, that same day. And so this was not that long ago, and that's that's where we're at right right now. So I'll I'll leave it at that for my opening comments. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and again, really appreciate folks being active in the chat, and especially the reactions uh, are wonderful. I don't know if this if for the panelists have had like their notes up in front, but lots of reactions throughout the presentation, which are uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, I also noticed that uh, I made a rookie mistake and used my own notes for the intros rather than ones I ran through the panelists. And I know there's one incredibly important omission that I botched, and I want to clarify uh, Dr. Kennedy Seidel's full professor, uh, which is not what I had in the intro. So just wanted to clean that that little bit up. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to introduce our uh, our final panelist and move towards the discussion, which I think is going to be uh, fantastic. Um, our final panelist uh, will be Dr. Johan Rurik, who is the executive director of Coalition S uh, and a linguistics professor at Leiden University. Uh, he's also the editor in chief of the FAIR Open Access Journal Glossa, a journal of general linguistics. He had previously served as the executive editor of the journal Lingua when its editorial team and board, as well as its reader and author community, decided to leave Lingua to found Glossa over 2015 and 2016. He is also a co-PI uh, of the Diamas Project, which aims at in, uh, enhancing and aligning diamond publishing in the European research area. Uh, Dr. Rurik, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. I'm glad you found that last specification about the Diamas project. Of course, the, the, the Lingua to Glossa story is, is old news, but I'll let, let me share my presentation with you and, and, and share some thoughts about, about this, because I mean, this is this is a bit older than, than uh, in, in terms of the transition. Uh, so before the flip, I was uh, editor uh, from 99 to 2015. So I'm, I'm, you know, quarter century of editing. Some people would say you... Uh, that, that is not a good idea, but I, I think actually you, you get better as you get older uh, uh, as an editor. Uh, the journal was founded in 1949, so it was a really venerable old journal, um, originally published by North Holland. Then until 2001, royalties were even paid to the journal. Basically, my contract with Elsevier consisted of a one-pager. Uh, then it's uh, and it increased to 27 pages by the time I left in 2015, and that was exactly the problem, as many of you have actually also uh, specified. Uh, the, the 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 increased meddling uh, with uh, of the of the publishers with uh, with the operations of the of the journal. So this interference uh, was was re really the problem, and. Uh, uh, from 2012, of course, I also experienced uh, the, the, some, um, some pressure from the cost of knowledge and the Elsevier boycott. So people started telling me, I don't want a review for you anymore. And so you really started wondering, you know, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? And uh, I decided I was part of the problem. <laughs> Um, so basically, we prepared a flip. We prepared it very carefully. We founded an organization, Lingoa, Linguistics in Open Access, uh, with a number of principles that sounded very lofty at the time, but have now been widely adopted, I think, uh, uh, you know, or are widely shared. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but but that we thought we should, we we would put put out there, and then in 2015 we actually flipped four journals to uh, not just uh, not just Glossa, but uh, Journal of Portuguese Linguistic Laboratory Phonology, Italian Journal of Linguistics and and Lingua to uh, to open access, uh, or most of them with uh, Open Library of Humanities. We had financial support for that because I mean I wanted to make sure that the journal would be able to to live uh, beyond uh, beyond the the, the flip. 
Uh, there was a journal manager provided by Radboud University in the Netherlands. We had long-term support provided by Open Library of, of Humanities, who is still uh, publishing the journal. And uh, by 2020, all journals were uh, very well established, and the ling lingua community was successfully moved to Glossa, publishing about 130 articles a year. That's very small, of course, for a journal like Neuro Imaging. So we, but we had humanities in humanities that counts as a big journal. So um, just to to uh, to contextualize that. Now, what are the lessons learned? Well, we also flipped. Uh, we also founded Matho and FOAA and flipped Journal of Algebraic Combinatorics to algebraic com combinatorics. One good way of flipping, if you want to flip, is just drop journal, <laughs> you know, and keep the <laughs> keep the second part of the title. And then Journal of Inframetrics to Quantitative Science Studies in 2019. That was an Elsevier journal. But flipping a journal is hard. So these are the lessons learned. Uh, it demands persistence. I mean, you really have to know what you're doing and you have to have your entire community behind you. <laughs> Everybody on the editorial board must agree because, I mean, it's sufficient. What I found is in trying to do this uh, with other journals as well, it's, it suffices that one person on the on the editorial board says no, and everybody and everybody just just falls back and nothing happens. I mean, so you really have to carefully craft um, consensus in the editorial board. And there is, of course, financial and reputational uncertainty. One of the things I'm working on now in the Diamas project is also to establish you know, an infrastructure for diamond journals that would allow journals to flip to that infrastructure rather than to go to another publisher where they pay uh, another APC uh, that is uh, normally nowhere than the other one. So I, I really want all, all journals to be able to flip to diamond. I, I hope you will agree. Um, uh, and of course, existing what the flipping, what also what flipping entails is that you lose the current prestige indicators, things like, you know, um, uh, journal, journal impact factors. This is something that people forget, but you totally lose your journal impact factor when you move your journal to a new one. So you have to be prepared to do that. You have to be prepared to go through the desert for five years if a journal impact factor is important for you. Now, that's less and less important because, for instance, Coalition S funders no longer pay attention to the journal impact factor, but still for many people, that is an issue, right? Uh, one of the things I sometimes flippantly remark is that is that since we have an impact factor since two years ago, because we had to wait for five years, we get a lot more desk uh, articles that, that I have to desk reject. So, you know, uh, I mean, some people would say crap attracts crap, so the crappy, uh, crap, the the crap of the journal impact factor attracts crappy, uh, uh, crappy articles. Um, but in in any case, and what 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 is never uh, what is never looked at by Clarivet to, um, by Clarivet to other other journal impact factors uh, indicators is they do not evaluate the content or the mission statement of the journal, and they do not evaluate the community that's behind it. What is simply So it's simply the title, and the title, of course, being in the hands of the publisher, that gives them a powerful weapon to keep everything as it is. Uh, so what's a journal? Well, you know what the journal is, but I think journal is first and foremost a community. This is something that I learned from Montgomery and Neil in 2019. It's really a community of authors, readers, editors, reviewers, and editorial board members. That's what it is. It's a community. And the journal is basically like a place where you meet that, and where you exchange. Uh, so this is really something that to keep in mind. That's what the journal is. But it also means, I mean, once you do this, once you go for your own journal, it means that you have to think about things like ownership and organization. The, because if it is a community, then you have to organize that community. And the title of the journal should really be in the hands of that community in a transparent and a democratic way. So this is something that we decided in the... Uh, a fair open access principle. So the journal should really be in the hands of a scholarly society and not for profit organization or an informal organization. And this is something I insist on because it's something that I didn't think of when I was flipping the journal. And so one way we did this, I, also in order to prevent anyone in future to, um, to sell the journal, is we had this foundation, a not for profit foundation, which owns the title, which owns the title as a legal owner, but we give beneficial ownership to the uh, editorial uh, board and team, which we call the General Assembly. And that means that the journal is in divided ownership. And every, everybody who knows about that divided ownership, which is, is actually quite typical when, you know, uh, uh, in a couple of uh, spouse dies, and then at least in Europe, and then one of the, one of the people uh, has the beneficial ownership of the house, but in fact, the kids inherit the house, you can't sell it. So the divided ownership makes it impossible to sell the journal, which is very handy because you never know, you know, if, if an editor in the future 
uh, you know, he, he, he gets debt or debts or, or you know, decides to retire uh, on uh, uh, handsomely. And I have gotten uh, re repeated offers to, to to buy the journal. And it, it's always a pleasure to be able to tell them, you know, even if I wanted to sell it, I wouldn't be able to buy my own statutes. <laughs> um, so this is something that I'd, I'd like to mention because I think it's important. And of course, responsibilities are uh, stipulated in our journal's constitution and publishers can't interfere with the composition and contracts and prices should be transparent. I'll stop here, but I thought it was important to share that idea about, about ownership because it is something that I had lost sight of uh, for, for a while, and it could be uh, inspiring for others to, to do the same, because you have to prepare for the future. You have to make sure that the journal cannot be sold and that it is really yours <laughs> in the hands of the community. That's that's my, my most important take home message. Did I speak too long, uh, Nick? Because I- No, uh, that, was, that was perfect. Uh... And lots of applause coming in, though I think it's also for uh, all of uh, all of the panelists so far. Uh, and just one one sort of note before we dive into to questions, and I use uh, moderators' privilege to to kick us off. Um, you know that that theme of library publishing um, as you know a an important avenue uh, for the transition um, from you know some of the commercial publishers that you mentioned to community centered open access publishers. Um, you know, I think is important to pull out, especially in light of, you know, I think the folks on this call that are, you know, on the other side of that equation, um, you know, providing that infrastructure and support uh, on the library side. Uh, and so while, you know, all their faces aren't here uh, on the program, just wanted to take a moment also to recognize the folks here involved in library publishing, supporting this from uh, from that side, uh, and hope folks will give a, a virtual round of applause uh, to those folks and all the work that goes into to making that that work. Uh, so again, uh, we'll plug the Q and A uh, for folks to submit questions. Great to see uh, those are already starting to to come in. These things are always so much more fun when folks are uh, active in the chat, in the reactions, and in the Q and A. Um, so thank y'all. Uh, and to kick us off, uh, you know, this is a, a theme that was, you know, each of you touched on, um, but I just want to explicitly ask, you know, for each of you to share a little bit more about how your individual experience has changed your thinking uh, about the power that faculty have to shape academic publishing to better reflect, uh, you know, your own interests and values. Um, you know, and that's something that's already started to come up in the, the Q&A. Um, but but curious, you know, what else you all might might share in relation to to that specific point. And given Johan's experience, he's going to start there. But it seems like the internet may have dropped, so I will uh, open up to anybody that wants to type in first. And I can say. I think I, you know, I'm, I've become more pessimistic, I suppose, um, given the current um, constraints of commercial publishing that, um, you know, faculty have the power over their own disciplines that, that I thought that they had. Um, some of those who have started new journals, open access journals may, may have more hopeful experiences um, with that. And I'd love to, to hear more from them. I think that, um, I don't know if I was surprised, but I was very gratified at the response from the scientific community because we're a pretty pretty big field. And it was kind of like, we're, we're with you. Um, we put up a Google doc that just said, hey, if you'd be interesting, interested in reviewing for this new journal that we're establishing, please um, just type your information into the Google doc. And again, within hours we had about 1200 people agreeing to review and no one wants to review anything these days, right? Um, so that was really amazing. Um, another thing that I thought was really nice was that it wasn't kind of this like peak media blip and then moved on. This is still a rolling conversation that's, um, I hear it at every conference. Um, I go hang out at our like MIT publishing booth for our new journal. Um, and people come up just to say, thank you for, um, making such a big move because like I said, we're kind of a, a, a big journal in, in my field. And I think the fact that it was us that were able to kind of mobilize this 
was a huge statement. And I think it was kind of those like, oh my God, if neuroimage can just quit and, and start this new thing, um, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And so I think it was inspirational, the, the, at least the scientific um, and like faculty backing has been like really, really uplifting. So maybe that helps leverage your, your pessimism a little. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for thanks for those comments. I I I certainly uh, echo them. I think it's a it's a good reminder that we do have power as faculty members, and it's important to use it. Um, so I guess it makes me reflect a bit on the the broader context of of academia, and uh, especially in our current political economic context. Um, you know, so it's. Like, as I say, I think it's a it's a responsibility and a role that we have, especially as tenured faculty to speak up for what we do and to push back against harmful trends. But the, the system doesn't make it easy to, to do that. So um, when you're early in mid career, especially there's so much pressure to to publish and to secure grants that it's it's hard to in, even have the space to engage in these bigger issues. Um, and even if you have tenure and seniority, you know, the current political and economic context of, uh, at least in my own context, I think others as well, um, budget cuts and selective devaluing of certain programs, um, you know, not filling positions after retirements and set, et cetera, which leads to increased workloads. It, it just presents considerable challenges to get just getting your own work done, let alone uh, engaging in, in bigger issues around uh, academic publishing. So, so there's, there's a sadness to all of this. You, you know, you're so focused on getting your work done and trying to meet internal expectations that probably the whole reason you got into this in the first place, which is contributing to the public good kind of gets lost and these things happen in the background and they happen so gradually and insidiously that by the time you notice them they're they're quite entrenched um so again just really um these types of initiatives and also the, this discussion is so important so thank you There's so many different threads that I want to jump to. I, I'm torn between diving more on the values or jumping into sort of, uh, you know, the process of the, the transition. Um, I'll go with the latter just a little bit because I think it's of interest to, to folks and I want to make sure we have lots of time for that, that discussion. Um, so already lots of questions in the chat on this process. Um, um, but I guess I'll start off with, I think you know, many of you covered you know, this in your, your presentations, but um, you know, if you could speak a little bit more to sort of you know, how long it took each of your boards uh, to sort of make the decision to ultimately resign and sort of share a little bit more about what that, that process looked like and what engagement with the journal's community looked like, if, you know, if at all, ahead of that, that decision and its enactment. Pick on, yeah, Johan. <laughs> yeah, but sorry, I was kicked out of the, but because my internet suddenly went down, I for no reason, I am connected by phone now. Um, yeah, it went actually quite quickly at, 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 at uh, uh, Lingua. I mean, you know, I had, of course, prepared carefully several months before the members of my editorial team first to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm planning to do this. If I find money to for the transition and if I find a permanent home in the long term, are you with me? <laughs> and everybody said yes. And uh, then we convinced the editorial board actually relatively quickly in a, in a relatively short amount of time. I think I would have taken more time for that in uh, if I had been had more experience with this, um, because I do think it's a it's 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 a decision a decision you need to take together and you need to take as a team. But it actually really works. One of the things that I was also surprised by is how much support you get from your own community once you start doing this. I mean, the the readers, the authors, the everybody is on board. You know, it's like it's like instant. <laughs> I mean, it's um 
and and that surprised me the most the 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 the, the idea or the, the the fact that you were pushed and carried by a community of, of of authors who all understood why you were trying to do this why it was important for knowledge to be open and and accessible to everybody in the world uh, and to yeah that so 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 that 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 it was very encouraging but i agree with all of you that this this is something that needs to be carried by senior scholars not by not by younger ones because well, first of all, I mean, you know, when you're a senior scholar, you don't know you you don't you don't you're not under pressure in the same way as younger scholars. So you you really have the time to do this, and this is the best time to do this, right? Because you you don't care about recognition anymore. I mean, if, if all goes well, you have had your recognition, and basically you should be selflessly working for the community. That's my view about this. <laughs> you know, I and mean, so so it's senior scholars that need to lead the way because also they have an example function, right? They have a they have the example of the, as a role model, and and that really works. I mean, you know, when you have some authority in your field, when you have the authority of an editor who has, who has done this for a while. People will trust you, and and this this was a very big surprise for me that you know people trusted me, and the team to 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 carry this forward. So you have to trust your community. That's sort of my my main uh, take home message here. Trust your community; they will follow. Judging from the nods, it seems like uh, this is a similar experience for the the rest of y'all. Uh, anything that that you would add, would love to hear it. Well, I saw everybody nodding, so that's just kind of nice. <laughs> I have something to add, but it also kind of goes to another Q and A, so it kind of bridges the two. Yeah, um, I went through this process kind of as a junior faculty to then like. So the reason the the typo in your intro is because I just got. Um, promoted to full. So it wasn't technically a time when you met me, I probably was an associate professor. Um, and so it's easy for me to kind of watch this transition to of um, power and, and control that that I have. And once you the community trusts you, which they do, because you're the journal that you, they want to submit to anyway, and you have their backing and you start this new journal. Um, there's these strategic things you can do that very publicly um, show that the community is behind you. And this is um, a, a specific question in the Q&A. Um, we, we reached out to a lot of prominent senior scientists in our field and said, would you like to join in maybe some like second or third issue of the journal um, once it's kind of got its feet under it and write just some big commentary piece, not on journal moving around, but just some major new thought that you have that, you know, would you put it in our journal? Um, and I'm not the editor in chief of this journal. And so I only kind of see this through him sharing with us. Um, I think every single person uh, agreed. And so there's going to be a really neat special issue that's just people making big commentaries on their aspect of their scientific field. And so other senior faculty will see that and be like, oh, well, of course, I'm going to keep submitting my stuff to that journal. We're hoping that the junior faculty will think, well, OK, this is going to become as good of as high of ranked impact factor, whatever crappy metric you want to um, talk about um, will come with it. And so I do feel really bad for the junior faculty who are like, I can follow my like moral code and boycott and whatever, but I also would like to get tenure. So maybe I'm going to submit to Elsevier journals anyway. Um, we're telling people that they should put notes in with their um, tenure portfolio. I mean, telling people informally, obviously, um, that says that this these papers that are published in this new not for, not for profit journal, you should consider that that has the impact factor of whatever point, whatever, because that's exactly the impact factor the journal had when it left Elsevier. And zero has changed with the journal except for the publishing company. And so it's exactly the same editorial board. Not one person didn't transition over. Um, so in my mind, imaging neuroscience has the identical impact factor that we had when we were um, neuroimage. And mm -hmm. That's well and good to say out loud to someone who's still a little um, scared of that, but it's the um, academic system really that needs to change. And I try to speak up when I can in those situations as faculty. 
the other thing that I think is an unfortunate um, stressor is how um, calculated and quantitative some of these things are um, for young um, Chinese scientists. And they pretty much have to publish in very specific journals from a list that their university say you need to publish from. And so obviously we're not on that list now. And they're like, well, we'll see you in three years when you have an impact factor and we're allowed to publish there again. And so we're working on a statement right now, hopefully it'll do some good, signed by the editor in chief and other prominent visible people in our community, the scientific community, to be able to kind of download from the journal website and submit with your kind of tenure and promotion um, materials saying that this is a legit high quality journal, nothing has changed. So we'll see. Again, these are early days. We've just started working on these, but I, I, I get that this um, disadvantages um, more junior faculty more than it does um, senior faculty for sure. Mm -hmm. really appreciate you sharing that uh, sort of push to encourage you know the sort of successor journals to be seen the same way and I think it'll be really interesting to sort of see and hopefully share stories about the extent to which you know that that works because that is in talking to you know other members of editorial boards that are considering a similar move you know that's the most frequent concern that I I've heard um, and I think that's probably yeah. reflects reality um, you know, about concern over the profile and the, the negative impact that could have, particularly for early career career folks. Um, and sort of building on sort of this theme, a lot of the questions that have come in um, have been about sort of what concerns were raised among the editorial boards of the community as part of this process and sort of how you address them. And I think we've already uh, sort of worked through uh, a number of those. Um, but there are you know, additional questions in the Q&A asking about, you know, whether there were concerns over potential, you know, sort of blowback or shenanigans from uh, the original commercial publisher um, that your journals were leaving um, that might make it, you know, difficult to transition. Um, mm -hmm. And curious if there are other, you know, sort of misconceptions uh, or, you know, inaccuracies, um, you know, that folks may, you know, uh, understandably think without having firsthand experience of the process, but, you know, now with each of you having gone through um, at least that resignation step, um, you know, those concerns, you know, didn't materialize or, you know, what may happen turned out to be a misconception rather than reality. Yeah. I'll say that, um, so the Journal of Political Philosophy, uh, um, their editorial board, you know, was instantly on board and resigned, you know, within a day or two in May. Uh, it was very quick. Um, and I don't think there were any um, reservations about that uh, decision. Um, I will say, though, so um, I do think the the fact that Wiley kind of unilaterally fired the longtime editor, I mean, he'd been the editor since 1993, um, did scare some other editors of Wiley Journal. So I, at the time, I kind of reached out to some other editors thinking that we could together kind of issue a statement or take a stand on this. And um, uh, I have, a, I think, an especially protective contract with Wiley, but I, I think the, that Wiley does have the ability to unilaterally fire most of their journal editors. And that was, you, you know, something I think that did, and people weren't willing to do that for that reason, I think. Yeah. Another, if I may, another thing you really have to be careful about is your contract. Um, many contracts now stipulate uh, with some editors, I will name them, but I know some, uh, I mean, the one name here in public, you may ask me, but stipulate that um, after your contract ends, you do, do not have the right to uh, be an editor for another two years. So it's kind of a non-compete contract. And of course, they cannot enforce it, but they do scare a lot of people. I was in negotiations with someone that I won't know who found out that that was in their contract. And uh, immediately all negotiations ceased to uh, because they had talked to their lawyer, their lawyer had scared them, and that was the end of the, of the flipping story. So you really have to look into that. I mean, and, and dare them. Of course, I mean, no publisher will ever actually sue uh, an editor who, who who does not respect this clause in their contract right i mean they would be that would be 
that would be the the end of their reputation. But you know, you have to take that. You, I mean, if you're the one taking that risk, mm -hmm. it is it is a risk. So these are things you really have to be careful about. You know, look at your contract, have a lawyer read it, have your uh, lawyers at the university read it because it could expose the university as well. So th these are things you need to take into account. Also for the impact factor, the impact factor is not something that we decide, right? I mean, this is decided by a commercial company, unfortunately. So what we need to do there is to convince the community to ignore the impact factor, to convince our universities to ignore the impact factor. Uh, following Coalition S, you can point to principle 10 of Coalition S, say, you know, we, no, we no longer look at the impact factor, we, we look at the content. So th those are kinds of things that we need to convince the universities and the hierarchy about that we, you know, we own the journals. We are the ones guaranteeing the quality of the of the journal content, and not the publishers. Publishers are service providers. That's what they do. They don't they they don't control. I mean, they don't add to the quality of the content. I just have to say, I'm struck by the the non compete, especially in the context of the theme yeah. for this year's Open Access Week. It's tough for me to think about a clearer, more concise example of commercialization over community rather than community over commercialization. Like, there's no community just, I mean, don't even have to ask the question. Like, there just is not a community justification for asking something um, like that. And so I hadn't thought about it until this conversation, but it just seems like such a clean and clear case study and where they're you know, is incompatibility between, you know, sort of community and commercialization. And there's, there's, and there's many practical things you need to think about when you're flipping, right? For instance, something like your your reviewer list. I mean, I had a reviewer list of 4,000 reviewers. I mean, in principle, I mean, according to your contract, that 4,000 reviewer list that you curated so carefully over the last 10 years or whatever of the journal is owned by the publisher, not by you, not by the community. So what do you do? I mean, I can tell you, but not online. <laughs> but but be careful. I mean, this is one of this is the first thing I took care of, <laughs> uh, so to speak, when I when I wanted to flip because that reviewer list is is gold. That's your gold mine. I mean, that's mm -hmm. and you're not going to manually retype all of those all of those emails, are you? <laughs> I mean, it's a uh, but th these are things we need to consider. I mean, there, there's a whole, we, we need to make a blueprint for this. That's, um... We're in the process of that right now. And it's not quite as clunky as typing in everyone's email list, but it's not much less clunky than that. So um, these early days of handling papers are a little rough. You can't just um, type someone's last name into the um, portal. Exactly. And That's the there comes, you're like, oh gosh, really? Of course this person isn't in here. And then you have to just, you know the field. That's why you're an editor and you have to be like, oh, right. So-and-so is at university of whatever. Okay. And yeah, then you type it in. Yeah. So these are, that can be avoided, right? If you, if you, yeah. If, yeah, if, so we did the- prepared, um, These are things that can be, and what we don't have right now is, I, I mean, basically, Every journal flipping is reinventing the wheel. That is one of the things that I find. And, and, and what we should have is a flipping community, basically. You know, a community of flippers, <laughs> people who have flipped journals and who help each other do this and say, look, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you, uh, you know, that, that's that's really what we need. Collective, uh, collective memory and, uh, and a collective, uh, collective action. We should absolutely do that. That's everything that we learned. Consider. <laughs> yes, everyone. I mean, you know, everyone. I mean for, for obvious reasons, this could not be a public, uh, a public blueprint, right? Because I mean, this is you. You would be basically giving, uh, handing out uh, uh, ways to the publishers to to to, to thwart us. But th th there is a way in which we can organize this in a smart way. And I mean, yes, of course. I mean, for instance, in my case, I mean, for 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 months, Elsevier tried to blacken my name. Uh, Saying that I was only trying to, um, to to maintain power, as if an editor has power, right? I mean, real, real power. I mean, it's Elsevier talking. Elsevier talking about power, the power of an individual editor. I mean, you know, the irony. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, all the correspondence is on my website. So what I did is I put everything on my website, on my personal website. So it's it's free for everybody to read. Uh, so I, I basically said, look, that those are their tactics. Uh, uh, 
but but basically you know it's it's really all about organization and about helping each other do this uh, because yeah i think this is this is the way forward we need to take back uh these journals and um, make sure that there, you know there's a clear division between content related decisions and and content that we control the content and then we farm out you know things technical the, the technical side of things you know typesetting copy editing website maintenance that that is something that we are willing to pay for uh, if if need be but that that division needs to be much more clearly established to come to a new compact between commercial publishing and academic publishing I've written about this elsewhere. <laughs> and Lindsay, I saw you come off uh, mute briefly. I uh, wanted to invite uh, you if there's uh, something that you'd add on this point. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, largely what others have, have already said, but I, I just wanted to highlight the, um, the uncertainty element. So there are a lot of uncertainties with making the shift. And we, we spent a lot of time just talking through the different scenarios and the, you know, the things that were now going to be on our, on our plate that that weren't before and kind of re-talking and re-talking. And so, you know, it's it you have to kind of reach a point where you're you're really solid and, and confident in your in your decision. Um, but but that was just quite a prominent part of our um, transition uh, period. And, and then on the converse, I would just again highlight as others have said, the, the support of the community um, was, was I, I didn't expect the level of support that we, we received. Um, interest by those outside of the community and those outside of academia even, um, who, do, who don't really know anything about it, just a great deal of interest. And I wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to, um, to just uh, emphasize the, uh, the unanticipated highlight of getting to know the librarians associated with the open journal system um, platform at the University of Calgary. I, it's, they are wonderful and, and very strong allies. Thanks. Amazing. Uh, love the additional plug for library-based publishing uh, <laughs> in totally. Related to the this conversational thread, but slight tweak on it. Um, you know, one of the questions here, I think, is probably going to be really relevant for a lot of, um, particularly the librarians on the call heading into Open Access Week, heading into a lot of you know presentations and conversations with faculty. Um, you know, I think many of which are likely to highlight, um, you know, you, you know, each of your your work. Um, and so, you know, in addition to what we've already talked about, I'm curious if there are you know sort of any other ideas. Um, you know, for how you might help to encourage more, uh, you know, other faculty members that are similarly situated on editorial boards to take similar actions and as maybe a more specific follow-up, um, you know, for librarians that are having these conversations with faculty, you know, what guidance you would provide to them, um, you know, to sort of have a productive uh, conversation with faculty, um, you know, about these kinds of possibilities and to sort of meet faculty, you know, where they are in terms of the, you know, sort of concerns that we've talked about, um, you know, in supporting this kind of a flip. If the, if the librarians at the University of Calgary are any indication, I would change nothing at all. <laughs> They they were immediately responsive. They were so helpful. It felt like they were reading my mind, to, to be honest. Like they just anticipated the questions I had. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a non-answer, but honestly, it was <laughs> you're doing a great job. I think actually librarian, I mean, faculty members don't know this and editors don't know this, but uh, librarians are a, a, an incredible resource when it comes to this. They know so much <laughs> and they know so much more than your average faculty member or your average editor. They they are really the ones who can help you flip things because I mean, they, they know everything. <laughs> it's really impressive uh, because usually, you know, there's this divide between librarians on the one hand and, and faculty on the other. And never the twain shall meet. It's very, it's very strange, but once they do meet, you know, you have this mind melt <laughs> that that happens, and that is really very useful. So I can, I can, yeah, I, 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 I agree with Lindsay. Just, just go to them.
Well, on that point, uh, the book I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Scholarly Communication, Librarianship, and Open Knowledge, I believe it's about 500 pages or so, uh, which I think <laughs> reflects the the breadth, of, the breadth of knowledge that goes into that particular aspect of, uh, of librarianship and the expertise uh, there. <laughs> uh, and it, yeah. Not everything's there, right? It has the accompanying living uh, document in the scholarly communications notebook. So totally, totally agree on, on those points. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking sort of about the, you know, the values-based reasons for uh, making the decisions that that you all did that, again, we've touched on, but we'd love to unpack a little bit more, uh, more fully. Uh, there's another uh, another journal that's not here uh, here today. The uh, journal of critical perspectives and accounting um, that's described a wholly different set of concerns um, with their commercial publisher, um, and specifically around the infusion of artificial intelligence into the editorial process, um, and how that seriously undermines the journal as a site for community building um, in professional development. They talk about. Um, you know, seem what might seem like innocuous changes like automatic reviewer recommendations, uh, uh, you know, based on H index, uh, you are not so innocuous when you actually look at the downstream effects, uh, you know, and how that would shape the journal uh, itself if adopted. Um, you know, or again, how, as many of you have already spoken to, um, how a key role of journals is, you know, nurturing early career scholars. Uh, you know, in a way that's difficult, if not impossible to capture, you know, based on an algorithm. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just another interesting example about sort of that, that tension between commercial interest and the community's interest, particularly in the context of journals as sites for community building. And so, uh, you know, love to hear from each of you a little bit more about, you know, based on your individual experience, did the demands based, uh, you know, the demands by your various commercial publishers undermine your ability uh, to sort of serve that community centric, um, community building role and professional development? I suppose you've each touched on that, but consider this an invitation to expound further. <laughs> I mean, well, I can say that one aspect of that is um, uh, the automation of, of copy editing by Wiley has been a real problem. So um, they've kind of outsourced copy editing and now they use automated software to do a lot of it. And that actually introduces massive numbers of errors. And I was getting, you know, when I first started as editor, I was getting authors writing me with two and 300 corrections to their piece that the software had introduced. And, you know, it was taking me hours of my time to kind of deal with the emails about this. And um, finally, I just said to Wiley, look, if you'll just not use the software, I will pay people to do this on my own. <laughs> and so I take my honorarium and I pay for it out of my honorarium to copy edit it so that they don't use their automated software on it. We so, hadn't, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, so go ahead give us this now. We hadn't encountered any mandated um, like computerized shifts like this, but just in general, we have these conversations among the editorial board that you everyone knows you can't just go for like the biggest people in the field for things one they're exactly the people who say no to review because they're too busy and any editor knows that the best reviewer on the planet is a postdoc who's still very hungry and thirsty for knowledge and wants this experience and they're going to have very low h indexes right and so if it if an algorithm tries to scoop people up to ask them to be reviewers it's not going to hit the right people it's going to hit a very um biased um, group of people. And so that's another thing that that underscores that the, the journal is the community where we're we were chosen to be editors because we know our field. And so I know that Dr. So and so has a really smart post talk because I talked to him at a poster at the conference. And that's who could exactly do the best review of this paper, right? That no algorithm can do that, right? And so that's one of those things that can't be automated. These are the things we just know because we love our field and we're active in it. And it's, you know, it's, 
it's kind of biased in two ways, right? So either like underrepresented minorities and in, in women scientists and whoever um, either get completely left out of the picture and neglected, or more recently I've seen the shift where they're the only ones who get asked to review, right? So let's, oh, let's ask all the, ask all the like young career women to review all the papers. And unfortunately they say yes, right? And so they keep getting asked, right? And so the older established people, whatever, aren't the one. And so why it matters is that's whose voice is having an effect on what gets published in the science, right? It's the difference in this very good manuscript gets accepted or re rejected, especially if it's a step or two out of the extreme expertise of the editor. We have to rely a bit of more on the reviews and a review that comes from some senior seasoned senior scientist is going to look and feel a lot different than someone who just got out of grad school, got their PhD, knows all the newest literature. It, it has a huge scientific impact who reviews the papers. And again, like an automated bot is never ever gonna know or understand that or get it right. You know, this is, this is actually one of the reasons why we at Glossa encourage people to, you know, uh, to do reviews together with their PhD students. So, you know, you train them, you train the PhD students, so you get a better, a better reviewer in the long run. And the older reviewer, of course, brings their expertise to the matter. So you, you that, that that is really a powerful tool. But of course, peer reviews have to be have to be um, valued more. I think we all agree on that. That's something that I'm working on in a different in a different capacity as well. But coming back to copy editing and typesetting, what we really have to realize, in fact, that these these commercial publishers are only out for one thing. That's the bottom line. And if copy editing and typesetting can be done by a bot, then they will do then they will do it by a bot. And this is, and the, the problem really is that we can't get out of it, right? That that is what what, what Anna is mentioning. I mean, you know, you can talk to Wiley until you weigh, uh, you know, <laughs> until Kingdom Come, but they, uh, they 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 won't change. They basically, I mean, they they basically farm this out to the cheapest copy editor in India, or to the, or to a bot, or to the cheapest typesetter in India. Now. We at Glossa, we also have a typeset with India, but that's someone we have via Open Library of Humanities a very personal relationship with. And they have, and they, and we talk to them and they have dedicated two or three people to just doing linguistics articles. And the advantage of that is that you're talking to someone who, after a hundred articles, knows what they're doing. And when there is a query in the typeset in the proofs, knows what the, the author means, even if even to me sometimes it's completely abstruse what the author meant, right? But they they know, they know what to do because after a while they get the hang of it, you know, they get the hang of our tables, our representations, our, our formulas, and you get a quality project product. And why do you get a quality project product? Because you have a personal relationship with that service provider who is actually working to please you. Because, I mean, the, the contract is time delimited and you could go to another one if you wanted to, but they are interested in keeping that relationship with you. And so you get a high quality product. And that's not the case as commercial publisher is that if, they, if for a half a cent less, they can go to a different typeset that, that, that does the work for uh, in, in an abominable fashion, they will do that. <laughs> There's nothing stopping them because you as an editor have absolutely no leverage over them. And that's the advantage of, you know, having your own journal, because you can negotiate these things. You are in a position of power to negotiate quality. Um, so, sorry, another rant of mine. <laughs> yeah, I think my, my colleagues on this call have, have really said it all, but but maybe what I'll just pick up on is um, the, the seemingly innocuous um, element of it. So, you know, sometimes the, these types of things are pre presented as, as helping us, you know, helping to reduce workload. And on the surface, that's very appealing because, you know, we're all really busy. And I know I mostly do journal stuff on evenings and weekends. I've never managed to fully get it into my normal workday. So, so you know, the idea of reducing workload certainly is, is appealing on the surface, but but it's kind of you know, it's it's not an innocuous, and so that makes it feel a little bit um, manipulative. Um, you know, because it just it obscures fundamentally different perspectives and and interests. So, so what a publisher may see as an efficiency um, might be experienced by editors as as eroding what, what is inherently a social dynamic 
that hinges on actual people with expertise and a commitment to the scholarship that underpins um, everything. And that is the heart and soul of, uh, of the journal. And you just can't reduce that to any kind of automated, um, any kind of automated procedure. Um, and I would also just echo, I think Kristen's excellent um, comments about the inequities that it that it can introduce. And so we we would refer to this as um, epistemic equity. So like research for the public good has to come from scholarship, scholars with different perspectives, different ways of knowing, different social locations, and different parts of the world. And you know, automated, procedures just flatten all of that because the people who are always the most prominent just become even more prominent and so it, it, it kind of entrenches and perpetuates the status quo which is very problematic for again research that's in the public good and especially research that's concerned at all with uh, issues of equity. Yeah, I think we could end the conversation on that note. I mean, we have six more minutes, so we won't, but <laughs> um, such critically important, important points. And I think also is a really useful transition to one other topic that I wanted to touch on, which is, you know, for those of you all that have established new journals, I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, each of your publishers represents uh, a different type of nonprofit publisher, uh, you know, in the Open Library of the Humanities, MIT Press, University of Calgary Libraries. Uh, and I know it's still early on um, for many of you in that that transition, but I think it would also be great to hear just a little bit more about how the experience has been working with you know your new uh, you know more community minded publisher, um, you know, and how you feel that's you know serving your journal and the community that it itself serves. I can go first because it's such an easy answer. Um, MIT Press is amazing. Um, <clears throat> again, the editor <clears throat> in chief did most of this heavy listing. He's he's amazing, um, but he kept us in the loop. We made all these decisions. Um, I every single thing that we could think about, um, MIT Press is like, yeah, let's do that. And we're like, hey, isn't it weird how maybe like a format of this does this? Is that have to be? And they're like, no, you can make it anything you want. Literally, we design, we pick the font. It's kind of like building a new house. Careful what you wish for, right? Because there's too many decisions. But we literally built it exactly how we wanted it. We um, we just set everything up. It was, I mean, it's almost Pollyanna-ish to say, but we we have had the best transition in, in experience. And something that I, I meant to say earlier, but it, it didn't fit in, is that just anecdotally, um, we have close to the same amount of submissions almost as we were having at our, our former journal. And they're at at least equal, if not better, um, quality, which, you know, that, that's a big fear, right? Um, and that doesn't seem to be the case at all. So as a metric, the, the triage rate versus the rejection rate versus the exception rate um, is pretty similar to what it was. And we have, you know, decade and a half or more of, of comparison to go back to with a neuroimage. So I hate to make it sound so Pollyanna-ish because it was a lot of work and, and it was really tough, but I, I think it went as well as it could possibly have gone. And we also, I don't know, we, we kind of did some very polite things when we all resigned too. So we're all, all of us, all of the editors, in addition to working at NeuroImage, we're handling any backload um, at um, NeuroImage um, until the end of December. And so, we, so we're, we're on kind of two platforms and, and handling papers. And that just seemed like a way to support the scientific community too, because everyone, I mean, if, if we left on, April 1st, you feel bad for the people who submitted to, to the journal on, um, you know, March 30th, right? And so we want those papers to be of equally high quality, no matter where it's published. And so we're still handling all those papers. Um, and so we have access to, you know, all of the resources we need for that. And we will until the end of the year. But there's a lot of things, um, you know, that it, it's been discussed, you have to think of in advance and, and mainly there are things like what what will not screw over the scientific community in any way. So we've, we've all been doing that. And 
not that we make any money in this business, but <clears throat> all the editors have have waived all of our honoraria um, over at MIT Press for like a couple years, at least until we get, you know, it's like solvent or whatever. And so, you know, all these things help and it, they're all unanimous too. Not, not one person um, said anything different when we voted all of these things in. So, and again, it's because MIT Press has been so good to work with. The problem is, you know, there's not MIT presses all over the world, right? And so they can't just take every new journal who wants to flee the big publishing. So I think that's a big thing in in this larger community, like for this webinar of how can we make more MIT press type entities, which I know absolutely nothing about. So yeah, that's that's why we need more infrastructure, right? I mean, for instance, e scholarship at uh, uh, at the uh, um, at the California Digital Library is doing that. They have about a hundred journals, I think, that they run in Diamond Open Access. If one of the members, if if one uh, of the member members of the editorial board is a member of the uh, California system, so so they do that. Uh, um, so what we really need, I think, is, I mean, MIT Press is great, I, I grant you that, but they, they could also, I mean, I also know that they would definitely flip to Diamond Open Access if there was a system for, if there was a system for that, that they can, that, that, that can finance it. So basically what we need is financial streams to publish it, to, to publish Diamond uh, in the same way as we now have financial streams, streams via transformative agreements. Uh, slow, slowly we we enough because I see comments about transformative agreements. Uh, slowly we enough ourselves from transformative agreements. Maybe, maybe for instance, do as uh, do better than what the Germans did. For instance, not have a transformative agreement for a couple of years and then use that money to start up uh, diamond open access journals. That's certainly a way to do it. I mean, we all know where we can find the papers, right? I mean, if we don't have access uh, by a transformative agreement. I mean, those kinds of actions could be coordinated much better than than we have done until now. I take Germany, for instance, Elsevier, they didn't have Elsevier for, for, for five years, but they didn't put the money aside. They, uh, so that money was lost to 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 develop uh, new initiatives. So these are the things that we, we need to think about together with librarians, with researchers, with university administrations to to change the system towards something better and, and build an infrastructure that we own as, as a scholarly community uh, worldwide. At the top of the hour, and I want to be respectful of folks' time, um, but Anna and Lindsay, de Lindsay, I definitely want to give you uh, uh, an opportunity to, to close this out, uh, either responding to that uh, you know, that particular question about your nonprofit publisher or, you know, any other thoughts, you know, you might share about sort of how this decision's changed, you know, the trajectory of, you know, the, you know, each of your academic communities and the journals that they serve. I've already gushed about the University of Calgary and we're still quite new, so I'll just end with that. Amazing. And I don't have a new nonprofit publisher, although I'm inclined to look for one. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's been great to hear these experiences. Drop me a line, I can help. I will do, I will do. Thank you, Johan. Yeah, yeah not for, I mean, we, we have to be careful about not-for-profit, right? Because there are some not-for-profit publishers who handsomely pay uh, their uh, executives a million dollar salaries in certain domains. Uh, I'm going to ask your opinion on the article, new article development charge, uh, but there were other uh, Let's not go there. pressing areas <laughs> with the time we had. <laughs> uh, we, we will soon have a blog about that on the Coalition S uh, website by Sally Rumsey, who knows these things very well. So uh, I, I we'll hope we'll be that. Uh, so... But 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 yes, I mean we have to be careful with not for profit because not, not for profit is not a guarantee. I mean it it has to be, yeah. There there, there has to be so, certain other boundary conditions that have to be met as well. I mean, um, like like very higher APCs and and so on. So we really need to yeah we need to change the system mo much more radically um, than 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 we have considered. Well, I'm very glad we scheduled this for 90 minutes. We could easily talk for like at least another half hour, hour, uh, but we'll not uh, we'll not keep folks here. Uh, uh, but again, really appreciate the incredibly active chat and questions from the participants. Um, and it's also nice to see the chat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wanted to you just explicitly thank you all, um, our panelists, for the work that you've done that led to this conversation. Um, you know, this com you know, this discussion just showed how much care and intention went into those decisions that they weren't easy. 
Um, but you know, each of your communities and all of us are better off for your having made them. Uh, so just really appreciate your working commitment and uh, also uh, want to recognize the, the corresponding working commitment of the many folks uh, on the audience side of today's discussion, uh, doing the work to support uh, academic publications that are community minded. Uh, so thank you again. We look forward to making this uh, recording available, and I hope this conversation will spark lots of follow-up conversations, and hopefully uh, those conversations will lead to actions and transitions. Uh, thank you all uh, so much, and uh, look forward to having follow-up conversations during Open Access Week, uh, the last week uh, of October. Take care, everybody. Thank you for inviting us. So